Welcome to Club X Souvenir Shop. Now, most of these souvenirs you wouldn't give house room to, but the tradition of souvenirs has been going on for many, many years. And this evening I have Henry Sandon from the Antiques Roadshow to share some of his, his personal memorabilia. Hello, Henry. Hello. Now, what are you first going to show us? Well, your bag of tricks you've got there. Well, it's to show that um, souvenirs go back a very long way. In fact, the first one I brought is, uh, uh, is Peruvian, about oh. a thousand years old, a, a cap. But um, it wasn't brought back to England a thousand years ago, brought back in 1828. As this was collected from a Peruvian uh, in exchange for gunpowder and salt, as a notice in the bottom says. But so it's a jolly fine hat. How much would this be worth now? Oh, not very much. 30, 40 pounds, perhaps. So is it all? Yes, because it's so not did, very valuable. When did people start bringing back souvenirs from where they'd be? Well, generally speaking, during the Grand Tour, you know, in the 18th, 19th century, when you went to Europe and you brought back something exciting, something to remember the trip by. Like something, the Elgin Marble. Like the, well, yes, <laughs> not as valuable as there, but uh, I've got something that's a bit like that, brought back from um, from Malabar. Uh, this is... It's a um, Fabergé egg. Uh, not a Fabergé egg, though, it, though it's a, a real ostrich egg. Uh, oh. A stuffed ostrich egg decorated by a carving with a ship and um, the word Malabar on it and uh, soldiers and, um, oh, and a, well, an a balloon, balloon up in the sky. So where do you hang this in your house? Well, it, it's not actually mine. Oh. It's borrowed for the occasion, really. So it's, it's got to go back to the person who owns it. Oh, I it, see. It. But I, they're hoping to hatch it into a happy event oh. one day. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, souvenirs uh, come back from Europe, generally speaking. Yes. What have I got here? Oh, this is a scene of um, a scene in Venice. This is a, a rather beautiful um, landscape of lovely. a town square in Venice, uh, made at the Royal Vienna factory. So, how old is this? Um, it's about uh, 1800. And how much is it? Well, it's this? a bit damaged, so it's not very valuable. But um, about five pounds in the state, it is. But it would was... you would you insure this? Oh no, not in you the would... state. It oh, is right. only if it was perfect. Right. Of course, the Germans continued making souvenirs, which came over to England in enormous amounts, especially things like this just before the First World War. This is German, although it's um, depicts Western Supermare. Western Supermare made in Germany for sale in Western Supermare when you went there on holiday. Right, and this is valuable. Um, 10, 15 pounds, oh. perhaps something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. Of course, the English factories during the First World War began to start copying these things and making their own. Is this goss? No, this is willow art, but it oh. could be goss. I've got some goss. You've got some goss beginning to get collectible. Ah. Some of the goss things, the rare ones, are worth a lot of money, but little things like this worth three, four, or five pounds. Oh, coming out there. Yes. But they're fun, aren't they? They're lovely, very I think, funny, they're, I think they're great fun. Of course, um, souvenirs um, started being made in England. I've got some very interesting English ones here. It's a nice basket, too. A nice right? basket. Like this this um, commemorates the opening of the Iron Bridge in Shropshire, um, which was opened in 1779. Uh, and that's a very rare example of the and first it, representation it's about of the Iron Bridge. 200 years old. So it's 200 years old. It's even got the name of the original owner ah. who had it made for him when he went to visit So it's like having, having your name printed while you wait type of thing. Your own name on oh, your own right. pot, yes. And worth a fair packet, I suppose a thousand pounds for very that. Nice. But this is one made 200 years later, made to commemorate the bicentenary. And it's the opening of the Iron Bridge. And it's a limited edition? Yes, made by the Coalport factory. And is this worth anything? Um, well, not so much, of course, yeah. It's oh. worth um, perhaps a roundabout to buy it, something like about right. 50 pounds. Like postcards now. We have postcards. Post I've got your personal favourite here. Oh, I've got postcards, really yes. So this is the ultimate postcard. Oh, yes, yes. Well, this is rather beautiful. This is a postcard to beat all postcards. A, a scene of the hotel where you went to stay in Germany. This is Berlin, um, yeah. and I suppose, you know, one of the watering spas of Europe, Baden Baden or somewhere. Baden Baden, indeed. You brought it back home when you were there and remembered it by. And so how, much, how much is very this? Very beautiful piece. About 1830 in date. This is going to come up at auction at Phillips shortly, and, um, and it's probably going to fetch several thousand pounds. Oh. So, uh, you put, would you put a cross there where your hotel? A cross where my room was. Oh. Yes, I would, if you oh. want to do that. Of course. One of the fun pieces of collecting is uh, is is this. It's um, uh, it's a representation of King John's tomb in Worcester Cathedral. Um, you might think that was a bit sick to do that anyway, yes. but the sickest thing is that um, it was turned not just as a tomb, 
but it was turned into an inkwell. So that when you want to use it, you write oh, your lovely. letters and pop oh, the two back on top. <laughs> In about, say, 100 years' time, will this be worth a lot of money? Will people haggle over this? Well, I expect it'll be worth a few pounds by that time. So, oh. so look after it. I will and, indeed. Um, put it away for 100 I years. I will. I'll look and, after it. Yes. And your cheeky sore spot, then. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> spirits? Spirits? Don't talk to me about spirits, my girl. I had enough of those last night. Why, oh, they didn't haunt you, did they? No, it was that second bottle of vodka. I should never have touched it. <laughs> Do you like gin rummy? No, I never nix my cheeks. I lost both my parents when I was six years old. Oh. It's one hell of a game of poker, though. Well, just a few moments ago, I popped out to the supermarket to pick up my beluga caviar, but also to pick up two shoppers. And this is what happened next. Woo Will you come to Club X with me so we have a look in your basket? No, dear. <laughs> no, no thanks, I wanted to go home. Oh. Excuse me, how would you like to come back to Club X with me? Oh, um, so we can have a look inside your basket? Yeah. We got one! Excuse me. <laughs> how would you like to be on television tonight? Why? Why? Oh, because we're looking inside people's shopping baskets. Yeah, right. Stop the clock! Yeah. <laughs> this is my first victim, Julia. And why do we want to look inside their baskets, I hear you asking me? Because tonight we have psychologist Susan Clemmy, I nearly got it right, Susan Clemmy, <laughs> who's going to analyse their baskets and tell us what their personality is like. Now, Susan, can you really tell the personality of somebody by their shopping? I think you certainly can, Reg. I think just like you can tell from people's cars, the cars that people buy, and also the ties and shoes that people wear, you can also tell from the kind of shopping they buy, on a very general level, obviously. All right, Susan, let's see how right you let's are. Let's have a look. We have a selection here. Right, Julia. I think the first thing I would say is you're obviously someone who worries a bit about their health. So the first thing that you do if you worry about your health is you get yourself some wholemeal bread. On the other hand, you like to have a bit of fun and relax a bit so it's not diet Pepsi, you know, because it's just normal, straight Pepsi. You're also quite conventional, I think, when you're in your working life. You probably work in some kind of office job, I would imagine. Tin food. But you like to have a bit of fun and you like a bit of what you like as well. Which is <laughs> what Don't we all do? Susan. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I would say about this lot. Someone who's obviously concerned about their health but not too concerned. And how do you think about that, Julia? That's fair enough, but I mean, the alcohol goes with that, and that's at home already. Nice. Fine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but don't you think that was fairly obvious, in a way? I think a lot of psychology is fairly obvious. You do? Really, that's what psychology is all about, it's raising awareness. Right, Tony, the next our one. next shopper. Can you bring out your goodies, please? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Mm. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is Tony's not long for this world. He's going to drink all of this by himself. <laughs> Oh, coke, he's obviously coke, quite a lazy individual as well by the looks of things. He likes to just open the packet and chuck away at the end of the day. And also, look at this, microwave tuna for one. A single man, no one's settled down with him yet. He oh. likes to rush in and get it cooked. And rush out and have some fun, I would say. Do you think that's fair, Tony? Yeah, but then again, I'm happy, even if I'm pissed. Oh, well, I'll, be, I'll keep this one for later. <laughs> right. Cheers. <laughs> Now, Susan, there's also you have a theory about shoes, I believe. I certainly do. I think that the kind of shoes you wear during the day say something about how you are ordinarily, and the kind of shoes you wear in the evening say something about your fantasy life and the kinds of thing you'd like to be. Fantasy? Hmm. Well, what about those? <laughs> Reg, if I tell you the answer to that, I'll be locked up. 